thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we're really excited today to have uh, Marnie Rosen Shapiro here with us, a uh, Grady grad from 1996. Yeah, I'm old. Um, she is going to talk to you a little bit about, she'll talk a little bit about Quibi, which is what she is, uh, um, the company that she's now working for. Some of you may have seen their commercials, both on the Super Bowl and they were also on the um, Oscars yep. recently. So, but mostly she's going to talk to you about uh, inclusivity in advertising and tech. So uh, she loves questions, so I'm sure she'll be encour encouraging you to do that. But anyway, we're really thrilled she's here. Please welcome Marnie. Hi. I kind of hope that picture goes away. Um, thank you guys so much for spending an hour with me um, on this gorgeous day. Um, I actually live in Los Angeles now, so I don't see rain, and you, you take it for granted how beautiful southern rainstorms are, or I guess you guys have been living in rain for like weeks at this point. Um, I'm going to do this without my notes um, because I like to wing it, um, but I also am not showing a presentation today. I want this to be as conversational as possible. I thrive on questions. I, I, I like to find my self-worth by how much people are talking to me, so please talk. Um, and I'm also going to say that I'm going to share some of my stories about inclusivity in tech specifically and advertising, but I'm not an expert. I have literally just lived it. So I spend time these days reading some amazing books, um, listening to podcasts, reading articles about how um, we can completely and profoundly change our industry by having an inclusive and diverse workplace. But I also know from my experience how very hard that's going to be. Um, and I believe you guys are going to make that happen naturally. I, I truly believe that you and the, gener the people that follow you um, are going to be able to change the dynamic that's currently that currently exists in corporate culture. Um, and I can just share a little bit of wisdom um, from my experience. So I'll give you a little quick background of, um, of my life and how I got here. I'm also going to say my parents are here. Um, I, Dr. King has heard me say this twice because um, I had lunch and then I did a guest lecture. It never gets less embarrassing to have your parents show up to anything. Um, I am 45, I have three children, and I guess I embar will embarrass them a little bit, but when they walked in, it's like I'm actually more nervous to speak in front of them than I am in front of you guys. Um, however, that being said, you guys I'm more nervous about than any CEO that I've ever met with. So I hope that I can add value to your lives, at least to your day, um, and there is really nothing that is off the table um, to talk about with me. So I'll talk a little bit, I will open it up at any point, don't wait till I'm done if you want to say something. And like I said before, there is nothing off the table with me. Ask your questions. This is the time to do it. Um, it's unstructured, and I did that on purpose so that you guys feel safe um, and you feel able to use your voice, which is a big part of inclusivity. Um, so uh, I am a grad from 1996. I have had a pretty great career. And that career is 100% because of my time at Georgia, and specifically because of my campaigns class and my advertising major. Um, I'm not saying that to, oh, I also use profanity, so if that bothers you, you should leave. Um, I don't say that to bullshit you. Um, I got my first job out of college because of our trip to New York. Um, and I learned so much through my time at Grady. Um, and I have taken those lessons and those connections and that passion for what I do with me for my entire career. So if you are lucky enough to be in that school, in those classes, go on any of those trips, please do not take that for granted and use it. Use the gifts that you're given from other people versus having to rely on yourself. Um, use it to your advantage, because I did, and I think that's why I'm standing in front of you today. Um, I also have imposter syndrome. I've said this before, so I can't believe I'm standing in front of you today, but I also can't believe it's taken me so long to get back to campus to talk about the things I've learned. Um, so I um, lead sales teams. That is what I do for a living. Um, I've become pretty good at it, I think. Uh, my job that I have right now that led me to Los Angeles um, very recently is to run the global advertising sales team at a startup called Quibi. And a lot of you probably have not heard of Quibi yet. You probably will right around April 6th when we launch. Um, but the company exists, but we have not launched to the public. So 
We are a platform, we're an app only platform. We are a premium content platform made only for mobile. It is exclusive content, it is Hollywood level premium content, and every single thing on the platform is made actually for a mobile session. So it is made in 10 minutes or less. So what you guys all have right now is access to unbelievable content, right? Here come my parents. Um, you can all say hi. My mom fell, so she's on a walker. But only temporarily. She cut her leg really badly. Um, so you all have access to amazing content. If you have anything to do with um, broadcast here at the college or um, any of the editing or the production classes, you know that right now is the biggest and most incredible time for premium content. But all that content is usually an hour long or 30 minutes long. And you guys live on your phones. Um, and so watching an hour long show on your phone when you only have seven minutes to spare sucks, right? It's just, it's like no good. You don't want to watch seven minutes of The Crown or of Game of Thrones or um, Fleabag, which I think is one of the best shows ever. Um, so we're re rewriting that script in every way, shape, or form, the way that you interact on the phone, the way that you can watch video on the phone. It's all brand new. It doesn't exist. It's all exclusive to us, and it's going to be awesome. So on April 6th, sign up, download it on the, on the App Store, and make sure you get the one that has ads, because um, that's what I do for a living. Um, my career has been pretty amazing. I started off in um, ad agencies on the media side on a, as a media planner, an assistant media planner, then a media planner, then a media supervisor. And then I left advertising to go into sales. Um, it has been the smartest decision I ever made because I um, am a good salesperson. Um, it was my natural calling to do something with other people and not do something by myself. Um, and what I have really come to love about selling is understanding the true value of building a relationship um, and earning trust and earning respect and being able to work in a place and in a way that um, share similar, similar values to what I, what I believe in. Um, it has taken me a really long time to get to that place. And I have been in companies that did not share my set of values at all, but I needed that job. I've been in companies where I've seen things happen to other people that maybe were not happening to me, that shouldn't have been happening to those people, and I never knew how to say anything about it. So through the course of my career, I realize every stepping stone that I take that I'm learning a little bit more about what it means specifically to be a woman um, in tech, specifically to be a woman in a leadership position in tech, um, and to now be at a company that prioritizes diversity and inclusion. So one last thing about Quibi, uh, which is sadly very different from the real rest of the real world. Um, Quibi is run by um, our CEO is female. She's a pretty well-known woman. Her name's Meg Whitman. Um, it was founded by Jeffrey Katzenberg, and he found Meg. They've known each other for 40 years, and he asked her to run the company. Our company now is super scrappy. We're 200 employees. We are 52% female. We are 40% non-white. That doesn't exist today. It, it truly does not. We are also the mix, exact mix, of entertainment, of Hollywood, and technology. And what I don't see ever at Quibi is the really difficult position that people in entertainment have put themselves in or are in, right? If you're a leader in entertainment, you might have a lot of the characteristics that you might see on trial right now. Um, if you are a junior, junior level person in entertainment, you are abused. It is just like part of the entertainment industry. In tech, it's a bro culture. And you guys probably all know that, but it is through and through. We've joined those two incredibly difficult cultures, and we have none of either of those. We have zero bro culture. We have zero divas. And when you read of the people that may have left Quibi, it's really because they're identity didn't really match with this new kind of company that we're creating. Um, and like I said before, every time I take another step in my career, it's really easy for me to reflect on what I wish I had known or wish I had seen or questioned. But I took this step intentionally because I believed in what this company was doing. And I believed in the way that they were growing a business that, that truly um, 
talk the talk and walk the walk, right? If they say that they believe in inclusivity, I, I promise you every single person in that company has a voice. They believe in diversity. Again, 40% of our staff is non-white. And for me having such a great career, for that to be so different than what I'm used to, just it, why does that have to be? So what I started doing um, is just really openly talking about that to friends, right? Um, and to other people in the industry. And what I have learned is that because people don't feel safe talking about it all the time, it will always lead to the opposite effect of what we want, right? If you aren't in an environment that you feel safe saying, mm, God, I don't think that that's the way that we should do this, then that environment's never going to accept other people saying, I don't think that this is the right way to do it, right? If you're not challenging what's happening in a corporate environment, how is that environment going to ever change? So my hope today is that you kind of hear a little bit of, of that, ask me real direct questions. Um, you don't have to only ask me questions about inclusivity. Um, you can ask me anything. Um, but what I hope for, and I've said this uh, in the previous um, lecture, I hope each of you learns way quicker, way faster than I did how to own your own voice um, and how to have confidence in what you know to be right and what you know is needed to make your company productive, profitable, and positive. Because at the end of the day, they're paying you. So you want them to be productive. You want that company to be profitable. And if you have an inclusive, diverse workforce, I promise you it will be more productive and it will be way more profitable because you're getting viewpoints and vantages of every single place in the world. So when I am growing my teams and building my teams, I specifically look for diversity not just in ethnicity, right, but in background. I don't want everyone coming from the same job. I don't want to hire people from Google. I came from Google. Like, I know Google back and forth. Um, I want to hire people who I don't know yet. I want to hire people from companies I've never worked with because I will learn from them. And if I'm going to be a good leader, I have to be able to learn from everywhere around me, which is another company value of Quibi, which is why I knew that I loved it, is learn from everywhere. Um, so a couple of big things to, to think about. Um, if you're walking into the workforce, um, you want to make sure that you are um, keeping tabs of what you're learning. And I say this because I didn't do that, and I really wish I had done that. Um, when I was writing all my notes that I have left in my bag, so I'm going to forget half the things I wanted to say today, um, what I was focusing on was all the jobs that I've had and the lessons that I've learned at each one of those jobs. And remember, I may not have known that I was learning that lesson until well later, like very far down the line. Um, but as I'm reflecting and I was asked to talk to you guys about that, I can really easily look at each one of those jobs and think about the lessons that I learned. So my first job out of college, right? Merkley, Newman & Hardy, it's now called Merkley & Partners. Amazing experience, got the job because of my campaigns class. Um, interviewed with them, and I learned the value of being committed to the job that I was in. Now, that wasn't a lesson that I understood at the moment because I wanted a different job. I took that job just so that I could get another job in the, in the ad industry because I wanted to be a creative director. Um, but I had a boss who looked at me one day and said, I'm paying you for the job that I hired you for. That's the job you're going to do. And I realized in that message that I was spending too much time talking about what else I wanted to do. And she was paying me. It wasn't a lot, um, but she was paying me. And so I very quickly pivoted, which is another big life lesson, right? You're, like, you're going to get stuff thrown at you all the time. You've got to be able to pivot really quickly. So when she told me that, I knew that the job that I was in and the skills that I was learning were way more important to me at that moment than losing my job. Maybe if I were meant to be a creative director, I would have been like, great, I'm leaving. I'm out the door. Um, but that wasn't the case. So I learned in that moment to be really committed to what I was doing at that moment. Right? Don't waste time daydreaming if you're not going to go for it, basically. Again, didn't know that was the lesson at the time. But I can reflect now and know very clearly that that was that lesson. After that job, um, I took a job at another ad agency um, that's really well regarded, based in Boston, but they had an office in New York City called Hill Holiday. And I was there, and I had a miserable experience. I was being bullied. I had no support. I was lost. And I would spend my days there, miserable, 
and I would leave work at lunch and walk around the corner to Merkley and cry to my colleagues. And I knew that I couldn't stay there. But again, I, was, I wasn't safe. I didn't have a voice there, and I definitely didn't know how to find my voice. So while I'm crying to a friend, he said, let's move to California, or let's move to the West Coast. And I said, OK. And I said I was going on vacation. I needed a couple days off. He and I flew to San Francisco first and then to Portland. And I interviewed at a bunch of agencies. And I got my dream agency job. And I quit my job. And they asked me to leave immediately. And then the media director, yeah, I, I mean, I can't, it was really bad. Um, but the media director of the company reached out a couple days later. Now, I was young, guys. I was 23 years old, maybe 24. Maybe I was 24, maybe 25. Um, I had never even thought to tell her that there was anything wrong because I didn't feel safe. So she called me. She said, can I take you out to coffee? And I was like, wow, sure. And she said, what happened? What happened to you? And I told her what happened. And she couldn't do anything about it at that point. I was moving to San Francisco, and I had quit. But she told me, you should have said something. And I said, I didn't feel safe to say anything. But the fact that I could even say to her, I didn't feel safe, um, with, and not laugh it off like, oh, no, it's OK. That was just happening, what have you. That was a pivotal point for me, that no one was going to mess around with me. Um, and I wasn't going to let people affect me that way. And even if it cost me my job, I wasn't going to be treated badly. OK, that's what I thought I learned. So I moved to California, I moved to San Francisco, and I work at Chiat Day, um, and I work as a media supervisor on the Levi's account. Dream job, absolutely amazing. I studied Chiat and Lee Clow in college. I always wanted to work for them. I idolized Lee Clow, idolized. Um, and I knew, oh, and my media director was from Merkley, so I knew her, she was amazing. The president of the Chiat Day office in San Francisco is a woman named uh, Carissa, she's amazing. The office was different. Our receptionist was a drag queen. Everything about it was so incredible. And I just thought, it's not going to get better than this. Like, nothing's going to get better than this. So I have my job. I live in San Francisco for a couple of years. And some pretty interesting things happened to me. I had my first Me Too, Me Too moment, which obviously we didn't know what Me Too was at the time. Um, but one of my most senior clients at Levi's was a man who expected me to do whatever he wanted me to do. Uh, whatever he wanted to do with me. And um, I would go out at night and end up in, like, he's driving me home, flirting with me. And I was thinking, I'm so young. My parents don't even know this. Um, sorry, Dad. Um, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I, I guess this is, like, the best thing ever. In my 24, 25-year-old mind, I'm thinking, oh, he likes me. That's, gonna, it's, that's what's supposed to happen. It is absolutely not as what's supposed to happen, not in any way, shape, or form. That man knew exactly what was going on, and he was taking advantage of a really young, naive girl. And I thought, this is how I'm going to be successful if he's giving me all this attention, right? Um, luckily, I got out of that situation, not meaning to, but there was a salesperson who had a crush on him, and she said something to me, and I was like, I don't even know. He's like 50 years old. I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, but it kind of woke me up, and I was like, this is super messed up. Like, I have to stay far away from this. And I stopped going to certain meetings. Now, let's just play that out. I am a strong, independent woman. I'm growing my career. I'm living my best life in San Francisco, I'm snowboarding every weekend. I'm killing it. And I am not going to meetings that could help me progress in my job because this man expected me to sleep with him. And I didn't want to go there. So. At the time, no one was talking about that. There was no Me Too movement. And I just felt <laughs> It just felt awful. Then September 11th happens. And I don't want to be in San Francisco anymore. I want to move back to New York. I felt very far away. September 11th in San Francisco was strange. I was crying. I was saying this earlier. I was walking down the street crying, and there were people like playing tennis and really happy. It was just very bizarre. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to leave. And I knew that I wouldn't work at another ad agency because, to me, it didn't get better than Shiat. Um, so I was on the phone one day with a woman who ran Cosmo, the, the magazine Cosmo. Um, and she said, what's going on with you? You sound weird. And I said, I'm just having, I'm really 
missing New York, and I think I'm going to move back. And she said, if you move back to New York, you're working for me. And I landed the most coveted job in print, period. Um, I was young. I had no sales experience. I had media experience, and I was selling to, I mean, they were selling to me. Um, but I mean, there were people who would have killed for that job. And here, this woman, who became a very dear friend and mentor of mine, um, was just giving me the job. In fact, I flew one of the very first flights back from San Francisco to uh, New York after September 11th. There were like seven people on the flight. I called my mom crying like, and saying goodbye just in case. I remember they, they really quick, I know I don't have a ton, a ton of time, but really quickly, I was going through security and they took away a tweezer. Like I had a tweezer man tweezer. And as a woman, if you take away a tweezer, like that is horrible. <laughs> And I started crying in security. And I, I didn't realize the emotions involved, but my life was about to change. And everyone's life in America had just changed in the world. Um, all that came rolling in, I go to interview at Cosmo. Susan is sitting in a chair, I'll never forget it, like this. And I was like, will you please, like, you got to get out of the room. I, I can't do this with you. But I got this job. And I worked for two of the most bad -ass powerful women in publishing. And in that job, I learned how to negotiate, I learned how to be a complete bitch in business sometimes when you need to. I learned hierarchy in a way that I had never experienced it before. Um, and I learned that I can get yelled at just as much as anybody else can get yelled at. But I never got yelled at because I did what I needed to do. I covered my ass, I made good sales, I was a great employee. I did all the right things. And I did those things because I asked a bunch of questions. I asked people, how would you do this? How would you handle this? People in the office, even though it was slightly competitive, I made friends with people, and then I would say, God, Susan's in a bad mood. Like, what would you do? And they'd be like, stay away from her. Don't go say hi. You're always trying to make it like chipper. Just stay away. And I listened to people, right? I asked for help. I asked for support. I listened to people, and I started growing my network. What's interesting about print, though, is that for me, as a young woman in print with these total bad bosses, Donna Lagani and Susan Plagueman, um, I was still in a, in a corporate environment run by men um, and really just experiencing these, this really weird world. Fancy, 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 but not getting paid enough money. Um, always asking people for money because I'm a salesperson, but asking people that really didn't even have control of the budgets to begin with. So when you're in media and you're in media sales, a lot of times when you're rising up in the ranks, you're like begging for, for money from people that really don't even have the power to say yes to you, which was a great lesson I learned from Donna and Susan, which is never accept the word no from someone who doesn't have the power to say yes. And I will tell all of you that while that advice is amazing for sales, that advice should live through your entire lives because all of you are gonna want something you're going to want a lot of things, right? And you deserve to want them. So when you go asking for them and someone puts you down and says no, really decide if those people have any right to say no to you before you accept that no. Now, there's going to be a day that you ask a president of a company a question or hire me and they're going to say no and they're the president of the company and you're going to say, okay, I'm on to the next one. But it's competitive out there. It's backstabbing out there. It can be all of these things know who you're talking to, know your audience, really, really know your audience, and have that confidence that you can get the answer that you need from the person who actually has the power to give it to you. So that was my lesson from print. What an amazing ride that was. I ended up working for Susan on and off for quite some time. I left Cosmo to go to Gourmet Magazine, um, and I didn't love it. I love Gourmet. I'm a foodie. I loved it. I worked with Ruth Reichel. It was amazing. Um, but I worked at a company called Condé Nast, and it just didn't feel right to me. Um, no inclusivity. I mean, there, I, I mean, like zero, zip, none. Um, and about, I think it was nine months after I started at Gourmet, I told this story earlier, Susan Plagueman called me up and she said, Can you go into a conference room. And I was like, what's wrong? Like, I always still think I'm going to get in trouble from, from Susan. Um, and she said, I am so sorry to do this to you today. And I was like, what? She goes, you need to quit your job. And I said, what? She said, I'm hiring you, and you need to go quit your job. I know you're not happy, and I want you. And I was like, thank you so much, right? Like, this is the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And I got what I thought, again, was the best job I could have ever had, which was running all beauty advertising at Marie Claire. 
What that meant is that I got a ton of free products. And as it, like, I had so many beauty products, it was amazing. I got to work with presidents at L'Oreal, at Estee Lauder. I got to build this amazing career. I worked with our beauty editors. It was so much fun, until it wasn't. And what happened at Marie Claire um, is what I learned, my lesson there, is um, what actual respect means. So what happened at my end of days at Marie Claire, um, I was at an upfront negotiation with L'Oreal with my boss, Susan. And Susan now, just for you to know, she's the chief revenue officer of fashion at, at Condé Nast. She runs Vogue. She runs half the beauty books at, at Condé Nast. She's still dear to me. I could text her that I'm working with, like I'm talking about her right now. Um, so we were at an upfront negotiation for L'Oreal. And um, Susan, I said this earlier, was being an asshole to our clients. She was being so rude, so pretentious, so arrogant and it just didn't line up with my values. And I realized that I just couldn't do this again. It was the third year in a row that we'd been through the same exact negotiation. Who's gonna be on the cover? Who's gonna do this? Who's gonna do that? And the way that the interaction was going, I just thought there's gotta be a better way to treat people. There's just gotta be a better way. And about a week later, maybe it wasn't a week, but it was real soon after that, um, a girlfriend of mine who had gone to Google called me and said, I, she called me a year and a half earlier, and I'm an idiot for not taking the call, but um, she called me and said, we're, we're really talking about beauty, and no one here knows that industry. Will you please come work here? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm off the crazy pills, which I was apparently taking a year and a half ago. Um, I will come in an interview, um, and I, I got my job, and I got a coveted job yet again. And I didn't go through months of interviewing, I didn't go through 13 people on an interview process at Google. I did have to work through my transcript and my grades, because at the time, Google required a transcript and a certain GPA, which I hate to say it, I didn't have. Um, but uh, it happened, and I got my job there. And Google, um, I worked there for a decade. And I, had, I got married at Google. I had three babies at Google. I had a great career at Google. But what I learned at Google is that I was operating in a very small box, and I was not allowed to operate outside of that box. And while Google is an incredibly wonderful environment, there's a lot of hidden stuff there in tech in general that seeps out when you really start digging in. And you guys have all seen headlines, and you all know what has been happening at Google over the last two years. Um, but all of that was happening when I was there. I just was really focused on getting married and having my babies and these long, beautiful maternity leaves and all the things that Google gave to me and to my family. I didn't take the time to truly understand that there were women around me not getting what they deserved because of the hierarchy at Google and because there were men getting paid $90 million to leave Google after they did things that they shouldn't be doing with women. Um, and I started getting really involved with some of the women's groups. So we created a group at Google called Women at Google, which is now extremely powerful. It's almost like a lobbying group at this point. When Sheryl Sandberg published Lean In, which I'm not a big fan of, but when she published Lean In, we created Lean In circles at Google. We did all of that. We had an unbelievable environment for women at Google. But strangely enough, the environment for women at Google also ended up holding women back at Google, which is the weirdest thing that you can think about. And then I started looking around. I'm like, everyone here is white. What is the deal? Like, everyone at Google. There were, I think when I left Google, there were 45,000 employees or 25, I forget the number of thousands of employees. Everyone around me was white, especially in ad sales. I was like, what is happening here? This is kind of crazy. Anyhow. Everything was fine. I was never going to leave Google. I would join my advocacy, my advocacy groups, and I would fight for what I believed in. And I did have a voice at Google. I was allowed to say what I wanted to at Google. I probably wasn't going to get fired for it. Some people did. I wouldn't have. But I also wasn't fighting that hard. So nine-ish years later, um, I was bored, uh, but I would never leave. And all of a sudden, Google called me one morning, or emailed me. I had worked out really early in the morning, and it was, I think, 6 o'clock in the morning in New York, or New Jersey. And I got an email from someone in our Google suite, Stockholm office in Sweden. I was like, well, that's weird. And the email was asking me if I would be interested in moving to Stockholm and running a team for Google. 
and I started crying in my bathroom and I woke up my husband and said, oh my God, we're gonna move to Sweden. Now, I have three, I'm Jewish, I have no ties to Sweden, but my three little kids went to this private preschool that was Swedish in Jersey City. It was like totally weird. Um, so I started going down this path of moving to Sweden and then out of the blue one day, I got an email from Snapchat. And I had not ever used Snapchat. I had not downloaded Snapchat. I didn't know anything about it. But I knew the second I got that email that I was going to quit my job at Google and go work at Snap. Um, I didn't know why. I had a few ideas. Back to operating in a, in a box. Back to kind of looking around and being like, what's going on here, dudes? Like, let's get this a little bit. Like, can we change this up a little bit? Um, and knowing that I wanted to build something from scratch. So uh, I learned how to use Snapchat. I got the job in like, I think it was like a week. Um, and went on the craziest journey of my entire life at that company. So my lessons at Google, um, I woke up at Google. I woke up and I was like, huh, I am surrounded by a sea of white people, just like myself, or a lot of men, a lot of men in gingham and <laughs> loafers. It's like a Google, it's like a, they're all my friends, but they're like, it's like a Google uniform. It's like gingham and loafers and jeans tucked in, it's crazy. Um, and I just thought, wow, I'm going to go work for this 24-year-old at the time at this app that when I ask an 18-year-old about Snapchat, they want to basically cry because they can't live without it. Um, and I'm going to change my whole life again and do it. And I felt liberated by that. I felt liberated and scared to death um, about leaving Google. And I went to Snap. And I did end up working for a 24-year-old billionaire. Um, I then ended up working for uh, Imran Khan, who was our chief strategy officer. And I realized very quickly that no values at Snapchat truly matched my own values. Um, but I also knew that I needed it. I needed to do certain things while I was at Snap um, in order to get to the next job and get to the next phase. And so I was able, I had had a great career, I understood my voice. I understood the power that I brought to the table. I understood my skill set. So I was able to use the company for what I needed versus it using me. We could argue some of that point. Um, and so I spent four years at Snap. And I'm proud of what I did at Snap. I'm proud of the teams that I hired. I'm proud of trying to create a diverse workplace. I'm I was proud of starting our first women's group at Snap, which took a lot of effort to do. Um, I am proud that I have a great relationship with the CEO of Snap and the founder of Snap and that if I email him, he'll email me back. I'm proud of all those things. But I knew at the end of the day that I wasn't going to stay there for 10 years. I knew at the end of the day that the stress of working at, at Snap, which is difficult, um, was probably not worth it in the long run. And so um, I made a decision that right when around four years came up that I would start probably looking for another job, as daunting as that may sound. I knew I wouldn't want to go back to Google. They'd ask me. I, I know that I didn't want to do that. Maybe one day I will, but I didn't want to do that. And I knew that I wanted to try to build something from scratch again, but build it the right way, right? Not the way that's already been established. Build it the right way. Snapchat asked me to interview for a really big job there. And um, whoever has been with me, they've heard the story already. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to get that job. I knew that they were asking me to interview for it because I was one of very few female leaders at the company, and they needed me to interview for it. But I worked really hard with my career coach. I worked really hard with my friends to make sure that I really, truly knew that I should get that job and that I could do that job better than anybody else. And I walked into that interview, and I crushed it. I crushed it so hard that I asked Evan Spiegel, give me a reason why you won't give me this job. And he could not give me one. I didn't get the job. And one week later, I got a phone call from Quibi, giving me the same job, a bigger one even, than I would have gotten at Snap at a startup that had values that I believed in, that matched my own values. And they were giving me the opportunity to build a team the way I wanted to build a team for people who I actually believed believed in. I believe that they care about creating an inclusive environment. I believe that they care about creating a company that is doing things its own way. Um, and so 
I was in Los Angeles, um, and I walked into, um, we had just hired a woman named Jeremy Gorman at Snap, who's our chief business officer, and she wants to be everyone's best friend. And I walked into a room with her, and I said, I have to have a difficult conversation with you. And she was like, OK, like thinking it was a feedback session. And I said, I'm resigning. And she said, no, 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 and just kept saying no. And I literally had to say, Jeremy, this is actually happening. I need you to take a deep breath. I'm resigning. Now, this isn't because of me that I'm irreplaceable. We are all replaceable. Just know that. Like when you walk into jobs, you are replaceable. It's because she was losing a female leader. And they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have let that happen. And she asked me what could have happened, what blah, blah, blah. And through my work with my career coach, I, I know that Snap isn't going to change. I'm not going to change the way that company is being led. Um, and so I was gracious. And I very graciously said, um, I have loved every second of my time here. I bleed yellow. I will always root for Snap. But you can't give me what I need in my career right now. And that is clearly demonstrated through this process. And I'm about to get a job that will allow me to have your job. And she said, I know I can't say this to you as an employee of SNAP, but if you were just my friend, I would tell you to take that job in a heartbeat. And so I knew it was the right thing to do. And I left SNAP and had a big party and cried. Um, just kidding, I did not cry, actually. And um, I went to Quibi, and now I am in an environment that doesn't rely on going out to parties to further your career. It doesn't rely on, to be quite honest, people sleeping with each other to further their careers. It doesn't rely on the bull that I had been used to for 15 years in tech. Um, it relies on people's experience. It relies on people's skill set. And it relies on people actually living our values of being the audience, of learning from everywhere, of always choosing the hard right over the easy wrong. Those things that I actually, at this point in my life, as I'm raising my children, I want them to know. I want them to be that. Um, and so now I'm there. And we'll see what happens on April 6th after we launch. But in my opinion, um, there was no downside for me to take this job, this risk. Because it is a risk. It's a startup. It doesn't exist. Who knows what's going to happen? But I got to have the opportunity to reflect on these unbelievable life, life lessons that I've learned through my career and put them into a job that I can help other people grow into the same thing. And then lo and behold, I meet Elise. Um, and she finds me in New York City. And she says, have you ever thought about coming back to school? And I thought, oh my god, I mean, I, I would love to, but I have no idea how to do that. Um, and here I am today. And it is such an honor to share that journey with you guys. And, um, and not to share it with you because it's so great that I have this career. Share it with you because it's hard, guys. Working is hard, but it's invigorating and it's incredible. And you all are way more aware of the world than I was. You have access to information that I never had access to. I was in the computer lab when someone taught me about Yahoo. I remember it. It was the guy who managed the Nathan Shepard band that I used to listen to all the time. OK, anyway. Um, I just didn't have access to that. And I feel like if I could, in the, the last session I was in, someone said, if you could go back and talk to your 21-year-old self what it would be, and I just keep thinking about that, um, it would be to be armed with information all the time and use it for good. Use it for yourself for good. Use it for the people around you for good, because everyone needs that support. You are not in it alone. And if you are not relying on those around you who can support you and lift you up, you will sink. So find those champions, right? Find that support. Find a career coach directly. If I could have gone back, I would have found a career coach directly out of college. Um, didn't even know that that existed. So um, that's my spiel. I would hope, hope, hope that it might spur some questions from you guys. Um, yes. Yeah. You're the second person to ask me that today. It's a great question. So the question was, um, how, how do you feel secure changing jobs so often? Um, and I will say that in media specifically, uh, it's hard to grow your career if you don't move around. Um, that being said, if you're moving around every year, it's, an, it's a no-go. You, you want to show commitment to companies. Um, 
But the real answer is that I didn't find a home, right? So I went to companies for three years, maybe at a time. I worked as hard as I could, and then I felt a ce I, I, I saw the ceiling. And I knew I was better than that. And so I, I found the confidence to find it somewhere else. Um, the jump to Google was a big moment, right? And I truly could have stayed at Google for a really long time. Um, but I, I had a fire. Something sparked in me when I got to Google. Um, for you guys just to know, when I, when I arrived at Google, we had just purchased YouTube. And so I was on the team that launched YouTube for, out of Google. Like, I built that sales team, along with Susie Ryder, who was the CMO of YouTube and came over to Google. It was the ride of a lifetime, because I, we were doing it in the confines of Google. So you were well-funded, um, well-established. I got to hire and then ask for permission. You know, Very different than a normal startup. Um, but it, it made me want to do that over and over and over again to build. And so even at Google, if you look at my Google resume, I moved around all the time. I changed jobs constantly at, at Google. And they love that. They allow you to do that. Um, but like I said before, don't apologize for what you want, right? Now, I'm not saying that right out of college, you go to a job for a year and leave because you want more. I mean, you got to put your time in. Um, but if something doesn't feel right to you or you think you deserve more and you're not going to get it, you know for sure you're not going to get it, and it come, that opportunity comes to you, take it. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, what's something you've learned at Brady that you've carried with you throughout your career? Mm. How does that help you like, now? Wow. Oh my gosh, I learned so much at Grady. That's a great question. So what at Grady did I learn that I take with me? Um, oh gosh, this is such a cheesy answer. Um, but I love advertising, and I majored in it because I love it, and I was fortunate enough to be with teachers who also love it and who taught me intricacies about advertising. They taught me things that were happening that I didn't know were happening. They taught me about different sides of the business that I didn't think I cared about, and the biggest gift I got was a job out of it. Um, I graduated in 96, and um, I'm reading a book right now about Gen X women. Um, it's an unbelievably fascinating book. But um, I graduated a couple years after one of like the worst job markets for college grads in history. Um, and it wasn't hard for me, because I had the school, and I had that support. And so I think what I've talked about a lot today is just making sure that you're finding support somehow. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I took um, and gifts, actually, that I took from Grady. Don't take it for granted. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, you said one of the most important things was uh, like getting a career coach and learning what a career coach was. So, uh, what's a career coach? Yeah, <laughs> great question. Seriously, I wish that I had known this. So I work with a woman who listens to like my BS goals. Oh, I want to retire when I'm this age and you know, I want to make money. Um, and then she boils them down to what's happening at, at your work? What's happening in the office? What are your challenges with team members? So I'm a people leader, right? So I'm always going to have these problem children who I love, but they're problem children. Um, am I getting paid enough? Am I getting paid equally to the guy sitting next to me that has the same job? How do I ask those questions? So career coaches are truly there to up your game and to make sure that when you walk into a room, you are prepared, you are knowledgeable, and you're better than everyone else around you. So she helped me, specifically helped me, in ways that I had no idea um, through this interview process at Snapchat. She helped me understand that I deserve that job, and I would do it way better than the guy that they gave it to. Um, and we did mock interviews, we did prep work, we talked about my ad strategy, what am I going to do that they're not doing right now. And so really good career coaches are going to make sure that you are developing your self-awareness and they're also going to help make sure that you're developing strategies to deal with something that's going on in the workplace. If I were younger and had a career coach, I would have managed myself very differently in corporate America. I would have cared less about being everyone's best friend and would have cared more about learning truly the art of business strategy, business planning, 
operations. I am not operationally sound, right? I'm a great people leader, I'm not a great operations person. Um, and if I had started a little sooner, someone would have seen that, right? Because I didn't have that own self, my own self-awareness there. Um, that is great. And the other, where, the other place that they're wonderful career coaches is negotiating your salary. And that is a lot of help that some people need sometimes. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that uh, like diversity is important when you're looking to hire someone, but what are some other qualities that you like look for, especially for someone younger like coming out of college? Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of things I look for in future employees. So first and foremost, I look for um, curiosity. I said this earlier, but it's my number one thing. If you interview with me and you're not asking me questions that make me think, I I, I'm not as interested, right? Because if you're gonna be on my team, I want you to bring ideas to the table. I expect you to bring ideas to the table. I expect you to challenge the way that everyone else is thinking. So if you're interviewing with me and you're not curious, mm, that's, that's tough. So I would say curiosity is a big one. Um, enthusiasm is something I look for, but it's actually more about um, passion or enthusiasm for the actual company that I'm at versus just going in and being like, I'm a great worker and I just, I, I just graduated. Um, I want to know that you care about the place that you're interviewing for because you guys are going to interview in a ton of places and some of them you could care, you could like give a shit about, right? Um, you're going to interview places and you'll be like, great, I just want this job. You're, the person interviewing you is going to know that. So have passion um, and be curious. Um, and I also look for people who are prepared, right? So I like for people to know about my life. It's a pretty open book. You can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, you could probably, I guess, find me on Instagram at this point. Um, and you should know a little bit about me, um, enough to ask me questions that aren't necessarily about what are your expectations of the role, right? Um, if you look at me on LinkedIn and you link out to a bio of mine or a talk I've given or any of these things, you're going to get little nuggets from those, from those talks or those articles and you can bring those up and I am always impressed by that. Um, I also think that the younger you are, um, the, the, I, I don't want to say more excited you are, but you are so optimistic, right? Because your careers haven't started yet. And the world is your oyster, truly. You guys are, you guys are gonna change the entire landscape of, of corporate America, you will. Um, go in there with that knowledge, right? Go in there with that confidence. Those things make me really excited about people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry, no, that's okay. What a great question. I learn how to adapt to other leadership styles through my career coach, first of all, um, linking these questions. Um, I think uh, the idea of adapting is a, is a pretty big topic in itself, um, and it's something you have to learn. It is not something that is natural to you. You are going to leave here, you're going to go into the workforce, and you're going to know what you've learned and have no idea what's to come. So I said earlier something about pivoting, being able to pivot pretty easily. Um, that's a skill that you learn. Um, and I think that what allows you to pivot um, and what allows you to adapt is by listening, by being curious, and by growing your confidence however you need to grow your confidence, right? Um, when you do that, you earn respect from the other person. So every time you walk into a relationship, if it's a different type of leadership skill, um, if it's someone you're leading who's challenging, always try to flip the table, right? It's not about them needing to accept you, right? It's not about them, like you figuring out what they need. This is a relationship, right? So try to have in your mentality, and I said this uh, in an earlier session, um, when you guys walk into an interview or walk onto a team, they're the lucky ones, not you, right? You deserve that spot. You deserve that career. You deserve that team. They're the ones that should be like, oh my God, thank God she's here. And if you think about that, truly, if you manifest that in your head, it can come true for you. 
Um, I think a lot of what we do is hold ourselves back with our own thoughts that are false, right? Our own false tracks. Um, so if you just walk in with a different mentality and turn it on its head, it changes. And then just be curious. So when you are working with different types of leaders, you have no idea what they're coming in with, right? You don't even know what this guy's coming in with. Like, you guys might not even know each other. You could end up in a conversation and you're like, gosh, that seemed, oh, that seemed a little, that per like you're perceiving one thing. He's like, I just stepped in a puddle. My book bag just broke. I, like, you have no idea what is going on when you walk into a room with people. So just try to remember that you're in control of your own destiny. Uh, they're lucky to have you. And have a little bit of empathy, right? You all are going to learn from each other if you're in that kind of environment. If you're not, you will learn really quickly how to alter that. You had a question. Yeah. <laughs> wow, the magic of sales. Uh, my dad was a salesman. I think I grew up hustling. Um, the magic of sales. How can I? I've, I've never been asked about the magic of sales. I think for me, um, the reason I think I've been successful in sales is that I have integrity and I've always stayed true to that integrity. I have never lied for a sale. I have never gone into a meeting completely way through it because I wanted that sale. Um, to me, that's magic. Uh, I think that all sales is is a relationship, right? You are earning trust from somebody so that they give you money or they give you something. Um, if you are not entering into that relationship in an honest manner, it, it's like a house of cards, right? And it can fall. So. I will give one example of what I think kind of sh illustrates that, and I hope that answers the question. Um, when I got to Snapchat, I was doing like individual contributor stuff for the first time in eight years or so, because we were a startup and Evan didn't like layers, what have you. So I was selling for the first time. It was a long time since I had been selling, and um, everyone was fighting over what they, you know, what companies they wanted to work with. On the sales team, it was really small. There were like 11 of us. And um, I asked the team, I'm like, who's working with Walmart? And they were like, Ugh, no one here is working with Walmart. I mean, this is like Snapchat mentality, right? They were like, go, go talk to Chanel. I'm like, Chanel's $2. Um, I'm like, Walmart's the largest advertiser in the world, basically. So I was like, OK, I'm going to go talk to Walmart. So I go to Bentonville, which is an amazing little town. I love it. And I meet a woman there who ran social media. Her name's Jody Durkin. She's a dear friend of mine now. Um, and I showed her Snapchat, and I was talking about how we're monetizing Snapchat. And she said, well, here's how we work at Walmart. I am so excited about Snapchat. I think Snapchat's going to be the next Facebook. I'm going to give you a ton of money. And I said no. And I refused her money for six months because I knew we would fail. And if you fail, it takes a long time to get back versus holding off until you know you're going to be successful. So I went back. My boss at, at that point was Imran. And he is a banker. He only cared about making money. Um, and he was like, what happened to Walmart? Blah, 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 screaming. And I said, we're going to wait on Walmart. We're going to wait. And he yelled at me a bunch. And I was like, I don't care what you say. We're waiting. Uh, we will fail miserably if we take their money. So that was in May of 2015. In December of 2015, they, spent their first, they, they ran their first campaign with, with Snapchat. It was a $200,000 campaign. Um, we had everything we needed for them at that time. We were very transparent with them about what we didn't have, what we wouldn't be able to report on, what we didn't think was going to work. Um, and in December, they spent $200,000. And in 2016, they spent $10 million. So that is the magic of sales. And that is why integrity, transparency, honesty matters. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. No other questions? Yeah. What are some things that you can be looking for when you're researching companies that might like indicate that the company culture is inclusive? That's a tough one. Someone asked me that question before. Um, what's happening right now? And again, I am not an expert. I am only you know, living my life. Um, and my, 
my bubble has been tech for a really long time. Um, what's happening though right now is this unbelievable effort to change the work, the workforce a little bit, right? To make companies more inclusive, make companies diverse. HR is getting a whole new face. Um, all of these kind of internal advocacy groups are starting. Um, so I think it comes down to a couple of things. One, research, right? Find out what's going on with that company. Who's been suing that company? How many people have they paid out? Like all of those things that are very easy to find these days. Um, and not necessarily in an ad week article, but in blogs and books and all of these things. So find out what's going on with the company and then find out if they're really trying to change. And you can even find that out through some of their HR pages, some of their you know, um, groups that they might support financially. Um, you can go on to websites and see like at Google, you can find out what's going on with their women's group. But back to that topic of curiosity, find people who work there and ask them. You, you will have your own like meter, right? Like you'll know if someone, you should know if someone's blatantly lying to you. But if you are really interested, really interested in how the inner workings of the corporation are, um, ask a lot of people, ask as many people as you can. Use your networks to network, right? Um, Cause you're not really gonna know. I mean, again, I've worked for unbelievable companies that say that they are all these things. And the reality is they might not be all those things, but they really want to be them. So maybe you're that change, right? Like embrace that power that you guys are gonna go into the workforce and truly change it. Um, whereas the people who've been running the companies for 20 years are not. They just truly are not going to change it. Um, so it's hard, but the only way you're gonna find out is by asking. Anything else? No? Oh, okay, good. Oh my God, was it okay? Did you guys like enjoy this time? Was it okay? Oh my God. Um, I will, so I'm just gonna close with my like cheer, my rant is that you are so damn lucky to be here. Um, if I could do it again, I would in a heartbeat. If I could live in Athens again, I would in a heartbeat. Just, that is, that is tough. Um, you have unbelievable support and network the hell out of yourselves, you guys. Like that is the thing I can say the most. I, I use me on, on LinkedIn, use your professors on LinkedIn, use all the people that come in here and just follow up. Um, not all of us will respond immediately, but we all want the best because we got the best. So just enjoy that. And you know, at the end of the day, don't be when you get out of here and uh, things could be things can be really good for corporate America <laughs> I would be remiss first of all thank you so thank much thank you and, and we have a little ah! here for you. And, uh, thank you